today's master class now i request to say few words regarding our chairperson and the subject uh, dr shotto gang who is uh, one of our course directors thank you and good morning to everybody today we have a very uh, important uh, subject to discuss that is alcoholic liver disease consumption of alcohol probably started with the uh, beginning of the civilization or prior to it and almost all of the country are suffering from this uh, problem and today our speaker is dr sanjay bondobadhai he is a very very good academician uh, past mbbs from national medical college then md from calcutta university dm from calcutta university he was attached to api for long time and many scientific papers in his credit i think all of you will enjoy his deliberation now over to you sanjay sanjay full screen kore de ha thanks good afternoon uh, my respected teacher is it's always am i audible yes yes, yes. yes. so uh, it's always a privilege to speak in api forum with in front of all my respected teachers with whom i started my journey in api uh, i am uh, yet very junior and is still learning from them and it's a beautiful sunday and my topic is approach to patient with alcoholic liver disease as has been rightly said by professor bonjour Bangu. make your voice a bit clear i think you come more to your microphone nearer to microphone <laughs> so my topic is an alcoholic liver disease uh, uh, when a patient presents with jaundice and ascites and i will uh, present before you this hypothetical case uh, to know the different facets of alcoholic liver disease okay sir consultant please key so 39 years old alcoholic male presented with jaundice and abdominal distension this is the basic case with which we started the jaundice was progressive but just for four weeks there was yellow urine subsequently the family members noticed yellow eyes there are no white colored stool no pruritus no skin lesion and no pain, significant pain abdomen except mild discomfort at right upper quadrant and this was followed three weeks later by slowly progressive abdominal distension that started in the flanks and this was generalized as associated with an early satiety however there was no pedal edema no shortness of breath oliguria or no history of fever any time in this four weeks so with these two chief complaints a patient who is 39 years old and is alcoholic for last 20 years with almost 5 days a week and frequent binge in last 6 months and he sustained because of its alcohol intake he sustained one episode of road traffic accident 3 years back and because of this there was familial dispute and she, he was separated from his wife so we are dealing with an alcoholic who was presented with jaundice and abdominal distension of short duration rest of the history was unrevealing now while approaching a case of jaundice the our basic intention is to differentiate it with uh, between cholestatic and hepatocellular jaundice and as the history in this case shows it, there were jaundice manifested by urinary urine and stool urine urine and eyes but there was no change in the color of the stool no pruritus no history of significant pain abdomen and there was no history of fever neither did the patient have any abdominal surgery or there was no skin manifestations in the form of jaundice mark so in all probabilities this makes the possibility of cholestatic jaundice un unlikely and we are perhaps dealing with a case of hepatocellular jaundice literature says nearly 10% of all alcoholics in alcoholic hepatitis presents with cholestatic jaundice and that cholestatic jaundice in alcoholic liver disease has a poor outcome as a worse prognosis unlike hepatocellular jaundice so our patient clinically has hepatocellular jaundice and as the history shows it's a short duration of hepatocellular jaundice in an alcoholic so the clinical diagnosis goes like acute alcoholic hepatitis though acute alcoholic hepatitis is often diagnosed clinically it's a well characterized syndrome character associated with features of systemic inflammatory response and patients are usually patients are unusually sick compared to their duration of illness and there are well laid down criteria by alcoholic hepatitis consortium 
when acute help, alcoholic hepatitis is defined as an onset of jaundice within 60 days of heavy alcohol consumption in absence of other causes of jaundice with a predominant rise in AST over ALT, but the values are never beyond 10 times, that is values are never beyond 400 and 500, unlike viral hepatitis. Serum bilirubin is usually more than three to qualify this as clinical jaundice. So our patient is a case of acute alcoholic hepatitis. Alcoholic hepatitis, unlike alcoholic liver disease, which is mostly asymptomatic, is characterized predominantly by jaundice and some systemic symptoms like fever, low-grade anorexia, and a diffuse or slight pain in the right upper quadrant or repigastric region. Ascites solely due to alcoholic hepatitis is very unusual. There may or may not be ascites, but this is very unusual. Rather, patients have other symptoms of affection of alcohol in other organ system, including muscles, nerves, and central nervous system. Compare this with decompensated cirrhosis in an alcoholic, where jaundice is almost invariably accompanied by abdominal distension due to ascites. So simple jaundice, well, we can diagnose as alcoholic hepatitis, but when the jaundice is accompanied by ascites, it's no more a simple alcoholic hepatitis. It is perhaps a case of alcoholic liver disease who was so far undiagnosed and now has become decompensated with the appearance of one of the characteristic feature of decompensation, that is ascites. So a combination of jaundice and ascites makes a diagnosis of decompensated cirrhosis. However, the clinical presentation is very short, just for four weeks, and there is no preceding history of alcoholic liver disease, though the person is alcoholic for a long time. The difference between compensated and decompensated cirrhosis is by the appearance of complications like jaundice, GI bleed, abdominal distension, or features of hepatic encephalopathy, and compensated cirrhosis in alcoholics is usually an asymptomatic disease or symptoms are present to a very low intensity. Whenever dealing with any patient of uh, alcoholic who uh, has developed ascites, rather than jumping into a conclusion of a significant liver disease, a consideration should also be given regarding the possibility of tubercular peritonitis because alcoholics are immune suppressed and therefore predisposed to a long list of infections, including tuberculosis in countries like India. Uh, constitutional symptoms are the predominant symptoms present in 70 to 80% of all tuberculosis patients, including tubercular peritonitis. Patient may present with fever, weight loss and loss of appetite. And these patients usually don't develop, uh, respond to diuretics, unlike patients of alcoholic ascites who at the initial stage responds to diuretics and salt restriction. Rather giving diuretics inadvertently to patients of tubercular peritonitis might cause diuretic intolerance and may precipitate electrolyte disturbances and acute kidney injury. However, this patient had no history of fever, no history of uh, uh, significant pain abdomen, and there was no pedal edema, shortness of breath, or oliguria. They were suggesting that the possibility of tubercular peritonitis in this case was clinically very low, as also the possibilities of other cases which are associated with volume retention like cardiac disease or significant renal disease. So we are dealing with a case who has features, some of the features of chronic liver disease, but whose presentation is like an acute liver disease. So perhaps this is an acute on chronic liver disease. The chronic liver disease remains so far undiagnosed and any acute insult might be range intake for the last six months. Any acute insult perhaps has caused this deterioration. So he has now full blown pictures of some of the chronicity, though chronologically, historically, the patient is sick only for four weeks. So the 39 years old male, alcoholic male with a jaundice and abdominal distension, entire duration of illness is for four weeks, but we can make a reasonable diagnosis of acute and chronic liver failure. If acute inf liver insult occurs in a normal liver, patient goes into acute liver failure. But if an acute insult occurs in a chronic liver disease, which the patient may, may, patient may be harboring without clinically manifest, that develops an acute and chronic liver failure where jaundice usually gives rise to ascites. And there are well-defined criteria by Indian National Association as well as a Pacific Association under Professor Sarin, which says that acute and chronic liver failure is an acute insult. Bilirubin must be more than five, INR must be more than 1.5 to qualify as the jaundice or coagulopathy of SELF. And that should be followed within four weeks by other features of chronic liver disease like ascites or like hepatic encephalopathy. Identifying this group is very important because this group has a very high short-term mortality. The 20 days mortality is nearly 45% and 90 days mortality is nearly 65% in country like India. Whereas, Compensated liver disease who goes on developing decompensation one after another, GI bleed sometime, ascites after two years, 
maybe encephalopathy or hepatic renal syndrome subsequently, these patients have a very low short-term mortality, though their long-term outcome is difficult to predict. So acute and chronic liver failure, though the patient seems weak or sick only for four weeks, his outcome is very poor. In, because in acute and chronic liver failure, it is not only the liver disease that dictates the course. Well, in liver disease, there are inflammatory response syndrome in acute and chronic liver failure that gives rise to immune paralysis that brings about sepsis and septic shock, <clears throat> which are favored by gut dysbiosis, abnormal bacterial overgrowth and abnormal permeability of intestine resulting in bacterial translocation. But in acute and chronic liver disease, there are extrahepatic organ failure, like failure of the kidney, lung, brain, circulation, as well as intestinal blade. So acute and chronic liver failure that starts as a liver disease in the initial stage and with a very short history ultimately culminates in the involvement of multiple extrahepatic organs. So we are dealing with a 39, I'm sorry, this is 39 years old alcoholic male with a diagnosis clinically of acute and chronic liver failure. Let us decide what was the chronic, cause of chronicity. Probably alcohol there because patient is non-diabetic, no history of hepatitis B and C in the past. And what was the cause of this acuteness? Maybe binge eating of alcohol, we are presuming. But in most of the literature, and as is our experience, the commonest precipitant of acute and chronic liver failure is a systemic infection. The systemic infection by far tops the list. There are other causes of precipitation like GI hemorrhage, there is alcoholic binge, viral infection, and drug-induced liver injury, particularly antitubercular drugs and complementary and proprietary medicines. In alcoholic hepatitis, apart from jaundice and tender hepatomegaly, patients usually present with neuromuscular weakness in the form of proximal muscle wasting, decreased hand grip, and some of the patients, even in acute stage, acute hepatitis may present with hepatic encephalopathy. It is important also in this patient, a patient we are dealing with, because now we are almost sure that this patient had some chronic liver disease which didn't manifest four weeks prior to presentation. It is important, it's prudent from our part to look for other features of chronic liver disease. And this could be a very uh, common, uh, common list to memorize for the residents and postgraduate students. Examination of skin might reveal spider angioma, gynecomastia, caput medusae, palmar erythema, or digital clubbing, or several changes in the nail, like pair horizontal white bands, teres nail, or hypertrophic osteoarthropathy, and in an alcoholic dupitrins contracture. There will be other features of alcohol intake and other features of hyperestrogenism, like parotid gland enlargement, like gynecomastia, like testicular atrophy. An enlarged dilated abdominal collateral may give a venous arm for polyvolier bone garden syndrome. There may be spider angioma, more than five is significant for liver disease, which are usually present in the distribution of superior vena cava and in, because of estrogen induced dilation of the sub epithelial capillaries. However, in decompensated liver disease, patient will present other features like peripheral edema or hepatic encephalopathy. Does of uh, all alcoholic develop liver disease? This is an important question, and this is a good argument which is put forward by our alcoholic patients who are in a denial mode to stop alcohol. No, not all, all alcoholics will develop liver disease, but almost all alcoholics, 90 to 100 percent, will develop alcoholic fatty liver. And once that develops in fatty liver, nobody knows who will fall into the 10 to 35 percent to progress into alcoholic steatohepatitis. And this alcoholic steatohepatitis ultimately lands up in a 15 to 20 percent cases in alcoholic cirrhosis. Some cases of alcoholic hepatitis may go on to develop al severe alcoholic hepatitis. However, some cases of alcoholic cirrhosis, 40% may also develop episodes of acute alcoholic hepatitis. And once a patient presents with alcoholic hepatitis, <laughs> studies have shown that nearly 70% have underlying alcoholic cirrhosis, as is our case. So any alcohol, acute alcoholic hepatitis, even if the patient stops drinking, 70% might have harboring an underlying alcoholic liver disease, which might manifest five or 10 years down the line. And cirrhosis is a risk factor for hepatic cellular carcinoma. And once alcoholic cirrhosis sets in, very surprisingly, nearly 2% per year develop hepatocellular carcinoma. Not all alcoholics develop this cycle, but those who are genetically predisposed with ethnicity, like Asian males. Asian males are predisposed to develop significant alcoholic liver disease at an earlier age, at least one decade before their Western counterpart. Female sex is a risk factor. Obese people are at risk. Those with an increased intrahepatic iron, like those with hepatitis C infection, those who have thalassemia or receiving multiple blood transmission, they are at risk. Recently, it is known that smoking is also a risk factor for progression of alcoholic liver disease, and particularly hepatocellular carcinoma complicating alcoholic liver disease. And there are various terms used 
to define this alcohol intake and its impact on the body. We use loosely several terms like alcohol abuse, alcohol misuse, alcohol addiction, alcohol dependence, alcoholism. And there are well-defined criteria about what constitutes heavy drinking and what constitutes, what constitutes a standard drink in the United States. And I think that values won't be much different in India. But as clinician, we are more interested to know what is the threshold value of alcohol that can cause liver injury. We know percentage of alcohol almost in all of the products like whiskey, vodka, rum, alcohol, beer, wine, etc., etc. But what is the amount of alcohol? Because people take alcohol in milliliter, in liter, not in grams. So we know the percentages and we can calculate the grams. The average threshold alcohol to produce even liver injury in male is 40 to 60 grams per day. And that should be taken for at least 10 to 15 years to cause significant alcohol-induced liver injury. However, see, interestingly, the values are much, much less for women because they are more predisposed to develop alcoholic liver disease because of less alcohol dehydrogenase in gastric mucosa. So more and more alcohol from stomach is diverted to the alcohol, uh, to the liver, and less is metabolized in the gastric mucosa. To clear the air on the use of so many words in the alcoholic liver disease like misuse, abuse, addiction, dependence, alcoholism, then a universal, more pervasive and all-inclusive term is alcohol use disorder, and that is consistently used both by psychiatrists as well as by hepatologists. Alcohol dis use disorder has 11 points. One of them is tolerance, another is withdrawal, and there are several other points, including impact on social activities, amount of significant time spent on consuming alcohol, major role obligations, physically hazardous, history of craving, history of exacerbation of interpersonal problems, and see, our patient has most of these features. So six or more criteria qualifies for severe alcohol use disorder, and this patient should be sent to re rehabilitation facilities. Presence of four or five criteria is a moderate disorder, and two or three criteria is a mild alcohol use disorder. If more and more amounts of alcohol are required to achieve intoxication of the desired effect, it is called tolerance. And if the patient develops symptoms on withdrawal, it is called withdrawal or dependence. Dependence could be physical dependence or psychological dependence. But in common day-to-day -day practice in chamber or maybe in OPD, it's difficult to remember all these criteria. So we are quite happy with the cage questionnaire, which is in use for last nearly 30 to 40 years, where C stands for cut down, felt the need to cut down. A stands for annoyed by criticizing alcohol, and G stands for guilty about drinking, and E stands for eye opener to get rid of hangover. If two or more are present, then we consider that is significant for history of alcohol abuse, and this patient should be seen by a psychiatrist or psychiatric counselor. A more detailed elaboration is audit, is alcohol use identification disorder identification test that is a composite of 10 points, but that is mostly very difficult. We are quite happy and we are quite conversant with the case questionnaire and for every postgraduate, while dealing with the patient of alcohol in the examination, case questionnaire, because this is very easy and it go, goes well with the history, history taking. So case questionnaire should be asked. There are very simple four points. So two or more points, if the response is yes or positive, then this is significant for alcohol abuse. So coming back to the patient, our patient showed a bilirubin of six, P-time of 16 and INR of somewhere between 1.4. So discriminant function was 28. So it had a bilirubin of 6, P-time 16 upon 11. SGOT, SGPT, both are raised but less than 400. Albumin was marginally low, 3.2. Creatinine was normal, considering he was a male. Ammonia was also normal. There was leukocytosis and urine showed past cells. Ascites was present on ultras clinically as well as corroborated by ultrasonography, but there was no infection of the ascitic fluid on aspiration. So how do we prognosticate alcoholic hepatitis? See, the most of important prognostic criteria for alcoholic hepatitis is bilirubin and prothrombin time. So a composite of bilirubin and prothrombin time called matrix discriminant function, which was discovered in 1976, is very useful and has been used for a long to identify who are the sick patients of alcoholic hepatitis. Because the discriminant function value of more than 32 qualifies for severe alcoholic hepatitis, and this patient should be tried with corticosteroids or pentoxifylin, depending on their predominant presentation. Because if severe alcoholic hepatitis, the 28 days mortality is nearly 75%. Three out of four will die. And giving steroid to this group will bring down the mortality by 50%. Apart from Madrid discriminant function, 
the more useful or more practical mailed score is also used to prognosticate alcoholic hepatitis as also ABIC score that includes age, bilirubin, INR and creatinine and Glasgow alcohol hepatitis score, which is a composite of five points. Interestingly, almost all the scores, almost all the scores include bilirubin and INR. And most of the scores also include creatinine or urea, which are the markers of the renal function. So in acute alcoholic hepatitis, you have to take into consideration the impact of alcohol on kidney. In clinical practice, we usually use matrix discriminant function and we differentiate patient between matrix discriminant function more than 32 or less than 32, because those who are more than 32 or even with a lower matrix score with presence of hepatic encephalopathy, that is organ failure, in acute hepat alcoholic hepatitis is a high risk group. And this group, liver biopsy should be considered because there is a study from UK that one third of all patients of predicted severe alcoholic hepatitis are not actually alcoholic hepatitis, they harbor some other infection. So liver biopsy ideally should be undertaken, but because of increased prothrombin time, it is not feasible and illegally. So these patients of high risk group or severe alcoholic hepatitis with discriminant function more than 32 or presence of encephalopathy, even with males or male more than 18, should be tried with a prednisolone if the predominant presentation is with hepatic encephalopathy or with pentoxifylin, if the predominant presentation is with hepatorenal syndrome. Pentoxifylin is not available nowadays, perhaps because they are not retained nowadays by cardiologists. We have n cysteine, which is very useful to prevent renal impairment in severe acute alcoholic hepatitis. However, person who are bad risk for of less than 32 or who, who do not present with a hepatic encephalopathy like our patient, steroids are not required nutritional assessment intervention, and then supportive therapy and close follow-up is all that is required. Coming to the infection, infection in CLD or any, any form of any etiology of CLD is a game changer because there are reasons, particularly in chronic liver disease as well uh, as in you know, alcoholic liver disease to believe that there are several ways by which immune dysfunction occurs. There may be impairment of neutrophilic phagocytosis. There may be inappropriate complement activation there may be enhanced antigen presentation by the dendritic cells with macrophage activation and release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Mostly they have several interleukins and guard derived signals also uh, stimulate this, uh, this hyperactivated inflammatory or immune state. So this, this immune dysfunction precipitated by systemic infection is a major game changer in chronic liver disease and often it precipitates an acute episode in chronic liver disease because in alcoholic liver disease, with the increasing severity of alcoholic liver disease, there is decrease in the number of naturally circulating immune or protective cells, and there is increase in the level of systemic inflammation and liberation of several cytokines, including TNF-alpha and interleukin-8. Steroid is a broad spectrum anti-inflammatory, and pentoxifylin is a TNF-alpha blocker, thereby supporting their role in suppressing this inflammation in acute and chronic liver failure. And particularly when you are using steroid, the chance of bacterial as well as opportunistic infection further increases. So a proper screening for bacterial infection should be undertaken in each and every patient of severe alcoholic hepatitis, whether or particularly if their matrix score is more than 32. And if it is positive, then appropriate antibiotic treatment should be given before considering steroid or in acetyl cysteine. Even if they are negative or antibiotic treated and corticosteroid is continued, which needs to be continued for at least 28 days is if responsive. In periodic, that is one, once or twice a week, screening for infection and appropriate antibiotic, antifungal or antiviral agents should be seriously considered because most of the patients who die, they die because of infection. They don't die because of liver failure. They die because of infection. Finally, in management of any patient of alcoholic liver disease, nutritional assessment is important. The nutritional assessment should start with weight changes, dietary intake changes, gastrointestinal symptoms, functional capacity, primary diagnosis and metabolic demand because alcoholics, there are studies that 100%, not 99, 100% of alcoholic liver disease patients who are hospitalized for different reasons, 100% have features of malnutrition, at least deficiency of two micronutrients. Physical examination may include examination of loss of subcutaneous fat, muscle wasting, ankle edema, sacral edema, or ascites that will give an idea about the hypoalbuminemia. This is subjective global assessment rating needs to be done by the physician, whether patient is well nourished, moderately malnourished or severely malnourished. This is a nutritional assessment of alcoholic liver disease that should be done at the first encounter with the patient. And it's not only albumin, there are several other 
proteins in the body as well as lymphocytes, which progressively decrease with the degree of malnutrition and with the severity of alcoholic liver disease. So comes the value of nutritional intervention in patients of alcoholic liver disease. Overall, a caloric provision of 35 kilocalorie per kg of body weight should be provided of which protein should constitute at least one to 1.5 gram per kg of body weight. There, is, there should be avoidance of unnecessary dietary restrictions often imposed by family members and the friends. A low sodium diet is advisable if there is ascites or edema. Patients should be given frequent meals, including nighttime snacks, and that should be encouraged. There are deficiencies of selenium, calcium, zinc, and several fat soluble vitamins. So they need to be supplemented. However, in acute hepatic encephalopathy, animal protein should be restricted and they should be replaced by vegetable or dairy based protein or should be given branch chain amino acid, which can alter the course of acute hepatic encephalopathy favorably. So, this patient had a discriminant function of 28, which we calculated from INR and prothrombin time and creatinine bilirubin. And this patient, because it was less than 32, so we treated him with supportive measures and nutritional care. And the patient went home. Next comes the second part of the story. This patient did not turn a follow up as is the usual practice with most of our patients of alcoholic liver disease. But at home, we had information the patient continued with intermittent binge drinking and amount consumed though was less than before. And because of this, at the onset of COVID also, he lost his job. He had to sell his house to, to meet his demands. And during the Delta epidemic, both his parents expired. So a person who is dependent on alcohol, now a jobless fellow, lost his parents and separated from his wife. This patient presented six months later in our emergency and brought by his neighbors and friends in a confusional state. So a patient who had an episode of acute on chronic liver failure due to alcohol and fortunately by God's grace recovered. Now in a state of confusional state, we call acute confusional state that is delirium in the emergency and nobody because they are neighbors and distant relatives, nobody has any clue as to the preceding event what caused this delirium whether there was any head injury, whether he continued with alcohol with binge drinking, whether there was any fever, nobody had any clue as to the preceding event. And it was, the, it was imperative for the physician at the emergency to come to a differential diagnosis, what could be the cause of this acute confusional state in an alcoholic without any prior history. This could be alcohol withdrawal delirium, we call delirium treatment. Nobody knows whether he withdrew from alcohol for a significant period of time and developed, and developed this. This could be a warning sense of allopathy because of thiamine deficiency in a person who is continuously taking alcohol and taking very little amount of other, other amount of food. Or this could be hepatic encephalopathy in a person who is harboring a chronic liver disease. There are other rare causes, but our differentials are almost around these three, alcohol withdrawal delirium or delirium treatments, warning sense of allopathy due to thiamine deficiency or hepatic encephalopathy. Let us see whether we can differentiate between them standing at the emergency. Alcohol withdrawal patients usually have a history of two to four days of cessation of heavy intake. Uh, these patients usually present with tremor and autonomic, that is sympathetic symptoms. So presence of tremor involving the entire body and autonomic symptoms, particularly sympathomimetic symptoms are very characteristics of alcohol withdrawal. Alcohol withdrawal is usually short-lived and these patients usually respond to high dose of benzodiazepines. Withdrawal symptoms end abruptly, unlike hepatic encephalopathy, which improves slowly and progressively. Withdrawal symptoms end abruptly and ends with deep sleep. So a person who is agitated and alcoholic, if he sleeps, if it is alcohol withdrawal, so he's improving or prognosis is good. A person is alcoholic and agitated, and if it is hepatic encephalopathy and was agitated, he if he goes into deep sleep, the prognosis is bad because he is deteriorating. Warnix encephalopathy has a typical triad of ataxia, mental confusion, and ophthalmoplegia, which is written in the book. But warnix encephalopathy has very clinically manifest nystagmus. So tremor and autonomic symptoms help in identification of alcohol withdrawal, whereas nystagmus, because ataxia and ophthalmoplegia is very difficult to examine in the emergency. So nystagmus is very obvious and very clinically manifest. So warnix encephalopathy, one of the prototypical symptoms is nystagmus. And this delirium is quiet. So the most silent patient is patient of warnix encephalopathy. Most violent patient is patient of alcohol withdrawal, as is usually said by your teachers. 
This patient has global confusion. And if the patient is not that sick or well oriented, there may be some features of derangement of memory and confabulation, which are a component of Korsakoff psychosis, which remains at the background of warning sensible pathy and are usually they are grouped together. Patient of warning sensible pathy will have a response to thiamine that can be tried at the emergency, but thiamine needs to be given at least 300, if not more. Patient of hepatic sensible pathy has a characteristic feature of asterixis and there is a Sweet speckled smell of fetal hepaticus. Now, this is very difficult to say what is sweet speckled smell. Those who have seen and smelled it in their lifetime as a physician, they know what is the fetal hepaticus of hepatic encephalopathy. So, asterixis is a very characteristic feature of hepatic encephalopathy, particularly in stage three and four, unless the patient is deeply comatose. And hepatic encephalopathy is characterized by hyperventilation. Warning encephalopathy is characterized by hypoventilation. Hepatic encephalopathy shows a very good response to lactulose, but oral drug may time to take time to reach colon. So pararectal lactulose will give a good response and there may be some improvement in patient symptoms. But if the encephalopathy is not reversed within 48 hours, the prognosis is poor. And those who are uh, admitted, we can have an elevated ammonia level serum fasting and venous ammonia is as good as arterial ammonia or EEG might show some slow, generalized slowing of the waves. So these are the very important points which can help us to differentiate because sometimes history is not available for the alcoholics. We can differentiate between alcohol withdrawal, warning encephalopathy, and hepatic encephalopathy. And that essentially remains the differential for a delirious state in an alcoholic. Nevertheless, we must not forget the, the possibility of trauma and sustaining head injury or subdural hematoma, which can occur in a patient who is alcoholic. So subdural hematoma, particularly if there are some focal signs, that also comes in a differential diagnosis of altered mental status in an alcoholic. So our patient on examination had moderate ascites, had flapping tremor and has an elevated ammonia. So among these three, because of tremor and an elevated ammonia, our clinical as well as laboratory diagnosis was a case of hepatic encephalopathy we are dealing. So a patient who had acute on chronic liver failure sometime in the past continued with alcohol and are now presented with hepatic encephalopathy in the emergence. Now, plasma ammonia level, be it venous or arterial, and now venous is standardized. Nobody does ammonia arterial nowadays. So ammonia is a very useful marker to differentiate or to give a diagnosis of hepatic encephalopathy. Because in hepatic encephalopathy, ammonia is high. Apart from hepatic encephalopathy, the diseases in which ammonia is high and rather very high are the urea cycle disorder like carbamoyl phosphatase deficiency, ornithine decarboxylase. But those are really very rare, and they usually occur in newborn infants. So for all practical purposes, if there is an elevated elevation in the ammonia, particularly if it is more than two or three times of the normal limit, the clinical diagnosis should be hepatic encephalopathy. But some of the cases of hepatic encephalopathy might come as normal ammonia. I'll come to this later on. A normal ammonia, normal ammonia level, even if you have suspicion of encephalopathy, we should rule out other possibilities like sepsis, drug-induced, alcohol withdrawal, as I already said, seizure or focal cerebral lesion. So with a high level of ammonia, it's probably hepatic encephalopathy and we can start treatment and no additional workup is needed, particularly if the patient had a previous episode of encephalopathy. But for first episode, or if there are other, other features of alcohol-induced neurological dysfunction, which might be concomitantly present, or if the patient is in coma, when it's difficult to elicit the asterixis sign, we can do EEG, we can go for cerebral MRI imaging that will show signal hyperintensity in the basal ganglia and related region. But for all practical purposes, ammonia is very useful. Not that all cases of hepatic encephalopathy will show ammonia, but if ammonia is elevated, the clinical diagnosis should be hepatic encephalopathy, and that should be a very good point to start the treatment of hepatic encephalopathy. Overt hepatic encephalopathy is characterized by three stages, stage two, three, and four, and these are given by waste and heaven. Flapping tremor is present in stage three and four, and in st stage two and three, and in stage four, patient is deeply comatose. In stage two, there is inappropriate behavior. In stage three, patient is confused. It is difficult to identify encephalopathy, which is stage one, or which is minimal hepatic encephalopathy. And in textbook, we have read that there are many ways to identify hepatic encephalopathy, like critical flicker frequency. This is a laboratory test, like number connection test, like block design test. But in emergency, where is the pain? Where is the paper? Some of the patient might be illiterate. And where are the blocks? But everyone has a mobile. Android, you can download with your net connection. So the very good bedside screening test to identify minimal hepatic encephalopathy is animal naming test. The physician can download picture of an animal on the mobile, show it to the patient. If the patient can name them properly because even an illiterate person in his own or mother tongue 
can name the animal because everyone knows person what is which so this patient responded to lactulogen rifaximin and this patient was discharged so we have treated a patient of hepatic encephalopathy with lactulose and rifaximin. The patient discharged after seven days, and I believe most of my colleagues will also treat this case with lactulose and rifaximin, and if there are evidence of infection with antibiotics. But did we do right? We treated with lactulose and rifaximin. Let us see. Primary prophylaxis of overt hepatic encephalopathy, we usually undertake in the setting of gastrointestinal bleeding or whenever we place tips. But management of hepatic encephalopathy till date, only drug which is approved is lactulose or lactitol, that is non-absorbable disaccharide. This is the recommendation that rifaximin is not recommended for treatment of hepatic encephalopathy, though we all treat hepatic encephalopathy with rifaximin given in combination with lactulose. Because the study which has shown that rifaximin is useful in the treatment of hepatic encephalopathy is small, red, or retrospective cohort and included only 120 patients and was an Indian study. So this is not recommended and needs further research. So patient of hepatic encephalopathy should be treated with lactulose and lactulose or lactitol if lactulose is not tolerated. But rifaximin is very useful for prevention of reco recurrence and this is recommended for prevention of recurrence. The standard criteria for classifying hepatic encephalopathy is called waste heaven. This criteria has very little utility because the outcome or prognosis does not depend on this criteria. Rather, prognosis depends on how efficiently we can identify and treat the precipitating factor like bleeding, infection, sedative overdose, electrolyte disturbances, or constipation. Even. But this criteria helps us to triage of the patient. Means which patient, patient of stage two can be managed at the ward, but they need hospitalization. Patient of stage one does not need hospitalization. Patient of stage three and four, they should be considered for referral or transfer to the ICU. If patient does not respond to lactulose, rather than adding rifaximin, the literature says that then we can add rifaximin or we can give l ornithin l aspartate We can supplement the diet with branched chain amino acid or we can use other non-uric nitrogen scavengers like sodium benzoate. And in case of recurrence, particularly in the hospital, we should evaluate for the treatment failure at 48 hours because 48 hours is very important. Alcohol withdrawal responds by 48 hours. Hepatic encephalopathy either responds or deteriorates by 48 hours. And we should also check the medication adherence and as well as education to the patient as well as the nursing staffs. And after resolution, proper care should be taken about patient education and the value of patient nutrition. This patient, we discharged after seven days, finally stopped alcohol. And that was a great relief for all of the, all of us. The patient stopped alcohol. He went to a rehabilitation center with the money, whatever he, as he, he got with the, by selling his house. He stayed there, came back home. He started business, a small business in partnership with his cousin. And now he was taking regular multivitamins, acamprosate and PPI. And because he has stopped alcohol, so he came for some visit to our opinion. By the time we saw that he was taking multivitamins, proton pump inhibitors, as is done by most of our patients, and acamprosate was given when he was at rehabilitation center for to control the symptoms of alcohol withdrawal. But somehow he feels that he uh, remains better with acamprosate, so he continued with the acamprosate. So let us uh, decide whether whatever he is receiving is receiving proper or not. Now, what is the effect of alcohol on vitamin disposition? Alcohol does not cause deficiency of all multivitamins, but there are studies showing that alcohol produces deficiency of only four vitamins. One is folate, vitamin B6, vitamin B1, and vitamin A. For folate and vitamin B1, it is mostly impairment in absorption from the proximal intestine. For vitamin A, it is impairment of the storage. And for vitamin B6, it is usually impairment in the metabolism or activation. So alcoholics or those with alcoholic liver disease, they need supplementation with vitamins and that was properly and rightly done in this patient by some physician outside. But that should be for, con, that should contain not only B vitamin and folate, that should also contain vitamin A. Acamprosate and related drugs are very useful to control or to suppress the apparent chemical signaling that occurs in the brain whenever a patient withdraws from alcohol. Acamprosate has gained much popularity because both the earlier drugs like disulfiram and naltrexone are hepatotoxic and cannot be given if the LFT is deranged. We have newer drugs like topiramate and baclofen, which are also very useful, but topiramate and baclofen are not USAP approved for this indication. 
so uh, he was given a composite which was rightly given but somehow he continued with it which was probably not justified as is usual practice our patient continued with ppi but here i must say that giving unnecessarily ppi in chronic liver disease will increase the chance of infection and once their infection occurs in a patient of alcoholic liver disease the entire picture will be bad and it will be gradually deteriorate one year later the same patient presented with progressive weight loss and that was a massive loss nearly 16 kg over 6 months and this patient also had pain abdomen and icterus so an alcoholic which is now on absenteeism and is doing very well with multivitamin and ppi and now presented with progressive weight loss and pain abdomen which is persistent pain and is really disturbing at night as well as there was icterus and because he was now on regular follow up so we wanted to investigate it now unintentional weight loss is when person loses 10% over 6 months maybe 5 to 10% over 3 to 12 months cachexia is a weight loss which is due to metabolic effects and can occur in any disease including advanced cardiovascular disease and sarcopenia is a loss of muscle mass so whenever dealing with a patient of weight loss history should account as well as examination should account whether it is unintentional loss whether this is cachexia or whether there is sarcopenia so in a patient who is alcoholic liver disease now compensated presenting with weight loss and pain abdomen there is a long list of possibilities but let us for the purpose of discussion and clinically possible let us come to three possibilities which are whether he has developed any new malignancy whether there has any new or other gastrointestinal condition that could be responsible for this because he is also having another that episode that is persistent and significant pain abdomen as well as jaundice or whether this could be due to psychiatric disorder which were not probably addressed at the rehabilitation center and because he is now dejected and separated from the family so might have developed psychiatric causes but for psychiatric disease like anorexia nervosa or other related psychosomatic disorder which can present with massive weight loss ictus is unusual as is the significant pain abdomen and weight significant pain abdomen so keeping in mind the possibility of ictus and significant pain abdomen we also shortlisted our list before that nutritional assessment rapid assessment can be given by bmi however for formal assessment and this is very important for the post graduates we need a global nutritional assessment tool for the anthropometry that will measure the mid arm muscle triceps skin fold thickness and there is dynamometer that will measure the hand grip strength which is given idea about overall muscle strength we can make a detailed assessment of dietary intake dexa will allow assessment of bone marrow density bone mineral density fat mass and bio impedance analysis can assess the non fat mass and there is a universal malnutrition screening tool i think this came in 2012 2012 somewhere and this is very useful because its score is 0 12 and there is only three points what is the bmi what is the amount of weight loss and whether there is acute illness or no nutritional intake for five days and depending on that patient can be ascribed to low risk medium risk or high risk but for Uh, liver disease patient there is another beautiful risk course in 2002 and the abbreviation is nrs that is nutritional risk screening that takes into account the impaired nutritional status particularly bmi and percentage weight loss severity and age of the patient so this patient we, when we investigated showed on ultrasound a 4 cm hypoechoic nodule in right lobe of liver in segment 5 so in hypoechoic nodule of in liver is very dangerous hyperechoic nodule means which are whiter than normal can never be malignancy but hypoechoic nodules there is a possibility of malignancy in a patient who is having underlying cirrhosis or chronic liver disease moreover the ultrasound also showed there is heterogeneous pancreas specks of calcification in the pancreas and the head of the pancreas was bulky so we are uh, divided what could be the cause of his weight loss and pain abdomen because both a liver malignancy as well as a chronic pancreatitis can present with this but it historically there was no history of pain abdomen suggestive of chronic pancreatitis and uh, there, was, uh, there was no mass in the pancreas though the head of the pancreas was reported to be bulkier so our two differentials was whether we are dealing with a case of ca liver or whether we are dealing with a case of chronic pancreatitis maybe with com complicated by ca head pancreas and liver metastasis but to our surprise both alpha beta protein and ca19.9 the markers of liver cancer and pancreatic cancer both came out to be negative in this patient alcohol causes chronic pancreatitis but 10% of all alcoholic chronic pancreatitis may be painless and up to 40% of all alcoholic pancreatitis may come with a normal amylase and lipase 
all types of chronic pancreatitis lead to pancreatic cancer. This is risk is more higher in hereditary cancer, but alcoholic pancreatitis can also lead to pancreatic cancer. And the risk of pancreatic cancer in alcoholic is increased by 10 to 24. However, 95%, 90% of pancreatic cancer or chronic pancreatitis will have pain and 95% on imaging will show a well-defined mass, preferably or 70% cases in the head. So presence of significant pain and presence of mass on the USG or further imaging makes the possibility of CA pancreas unlikely though, though the patient is perhaps having because of long-term alcohol intake and subclinical chronic pancreatitis with specs of calcification in the pancreas. So we remain concerned about the liver nodule and this is a standard guidelines which says if a liver nodule is less than one centimeter, we can ignore for the time being and repeat ultrasound repeatedly with a growing and changing pattern, we can subject them to FNC. But if a liver nodule in a particular in patient with chronic liver disease is more than one centimeter, a three-phase or four-phase dynamic MRI or a three-phase CT scan should be done because liver cancer will show arterial hypervascularity and rapid washout because liver cancers or hepatocellular carcinomas are fed by hepatic arteries and not by portal veins. Though portal vein constitutes normally 70% of entire blood supply to the liver, hepatocellular carcinomas are fed by hepatic arteries. So they will be rapidly, dyes will be rapidly taken up, contrast taken up in the arterial phase, but in portal and direct phase, it will be rapidly washed out. This is very characteristic of hepatocellular carcinoma. Though, so in our patient, though the patient has a very low alpha protein, whenever we investigated, the patient showed arterial hypervascularity and a rapid washout, they were making a diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma, very possible. Let us look what the Indian literature on hepatocellular carcinoma says. We have two beautiful series by two uh, stalwarts from Delhi. Now, 60% cases of all hepatocellular carcinoma in India complicate chronic liver disease or cirrhosis. And in 40%, this could be the first presentation. Unfortunately, 83% present with advanced stage. And interestingly, 25% in one series and 46% in another series showed AFP was elevated. So majority of Indian hepatocellular carcinomas, if these two series are to be believed by two stalwarts, are not associated with rise in alpha fetoprotein. Triphasic CT is the diagnostic modality of choice, and the triad is abdominal pain, weight loss, and anorexia. And it is usually present with a recent worsening of a stable liver disease in nearly 75% of the cases. So this patient who came out to be a case of hepatocellular carcinoma on further FNAC, uh, and because this patient has a child class C, he had a single nodule of four centimeter, bilirubin was raised with features of portal hypertension on imaging. So we referred this patient to higher center for liver transplantation. Therefore, respected teachers, to conclude, my presentation today was a patient of alcohol intake who presented with fever, jaundice, and ascites. We started with acute alcoholic hepatitis, but came to know that this is a case of acute on chronic liver failure and a background of underlying chronic liver disease because the patient continued to intake alcohol. So liver function further deteriorated when the patient presented with acute confusional state. We came, made a diagnosis of hepatic encephalopathy, treated, and left, discharged the patient. The man was so unfortunate to develop a hepatocellular carcinoma with presentation of rapid acute weight loss in the follow-up period. And we then approached this, which came as a liver nodule on the imaging studies, and we reached a diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma. And we referred him rightly to a higher center where he can undergo liver transplantation if the facility is permitted. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, okay, now I request uh, Dr. Kalidas Vishas, who is uh, chairperson of this session, to take up the issue. And there are five or six questions in the chat box. Kalidas is requested to give his opinion and take up the questions uh, from the chat box. Shonja, you or Kalidas uh, can Kalidas, take up no. the questions. I saw Kalidas. Anyway, if he is not available, I request Sanjoy from the yes. chat box. There are exclusively from Dr. Shivendu Ghost. All six. Net, net. Okay. 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 Okay.
six questions, then you take up the question. Sanjay Banerjee, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You How take up the question. The first question by Professor Shivitra. Yes, okay. How you differentiate between acute alcoholic and sulfate were chronic? I think I have elaborated it. In the absence of history of alcohol intake, we can, can we differentiate MFLD, alcoholic liver disease? So that, that is the problem for diagnosing non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Because nobody knows what constitutes significant alcohol because nobody takes it in grams and nobody keeps a record. So that is the idea why in 2020, International Liver Congress proposed to change the term from NFLD to MFLD. Because even if history of alcohol intake is present, a patient who has presented with liver disease and at least two features of metabolic syndrome, they will qualify as MFLD, irrespective of amount of alcohol taken. So emphasis is to identify the metabolic syndrome associated liver disease at an early stage. So I, I, I do agree and I accept the fact that this is very, very difficult to differentiate because nobody keeps a diary of amount of alcohol taken over the last 5, 10 or 15 years. So forget about alcohol. If you are making a diagnosis of MFLD, person should have liver disease and at least two features of metabolic syndrome. And there are eight features what constitu that constitutes the list. We have to remember the list. There are eight features. If out of two is present or even a single feature present, patient is a diabetic, type 2 diabetic, then liver disease plus type 2 diabetic is MFLD or liver disease plus any two features of the long list of eight is MFLD. Don't bring the possibility or the confounding effect of alcohol if you are going to make a diagnosis of MFL. Yes. Now, third is role of GMCSF in alcoholic severe hepatitis. See, GMCSF has been proposed by Professor Sarin and exclusively by Professor Sarin. He had several papers over the three to four years. He has shown that, particularly in ACLF like presentation in severe alcoholic hepatitis, GMCSF is as good as steroid if you consider its efficacy. And side effects are less because steroid is prone to give side effects superimposed infection, there may be GI bleed. And steroid does not protect the renal failure or renal impairment of hepatorenal syndrome component of acute alcoholic hepatitis. So efficacy wise same, side effects are less. But, and GMCSF you have to give in intravenous, very short course, five days. But problem is that most of the world authority is not agreeing to believe these results. And unless there are multicentral trial, and unless there is a trial incorporating large number of patients, GMCSF is not approved and GSCSF has no established role in management of severe alcoholic hepatitis. If you have to treat with steroid, even in acetyl cysteine, the evidence is very limited. Pentoxifilin is not available. As Kalidas. Kalidas, Sanjay to continue. Sanjay to continue. Okay. Uh, I am also telling you, apart from the six questions in the chat box, there are two questions in the question and answer box. Okay, you okay, take okay, care okay. of those two questions okay. also. Okay. So how to differentiate between infective encephalopathy from acute alcoholic liver disease and encephalopathy? You have to do CSF because infection will be given by CSF study. Uh, alcoholic liver disease, CSF will be a blunt fact. So procalcitonin in differentiating between infective, this is, I think this is known. This, this is known to all the physicians because procalcitonin helps in differentiating between infection and non-infective problems. We are no more relying on CRP or lymphocytosis. Procalcitonin is a good problem is it's costly uh, and needs to be repeated, which is even makes it costlier. When you should start medicine to abstain, uh, abstain, I think when you start treatment to uh, medicine to treat alcohol withdrawal, see patient having symptoms of alcohol withdrawal, but at least it's better not to start within the first 48 hours. Uh, neurological imaging in alcoholic disease, this is, this is very important. Neurological imaging. I initially thought that I should include a few slides about uh, neurological imaging, uh, but uh, somehow this is primarily designed for the MD medicine and DMV medicine students, so I did not take up that. Neurological imaging in alcoholic liver disease, if you have to do, always rely on MRI. There is no value doing CT scan because MRI will say so many findings, some related to chronic liver disease and some related to alcohol. There may be, there is a term called Marchia of a big mammy syndrome. There is extensive sclerosis of the white tracts in the central nervous system. In chronic liver disease, we'll show increased uh, hyperintensity in the basal ganglia region. There may be atrophy of the mammillary body, what is seen in some cases of warning sensibility and course of psychosis. So imaging in alcoholic liver disease is mostly of theoretical importance. They don't help in identifying the diagnosis unless the patient has presented with the neurological features. And obviously in acute confusional state, we have to go for neuroimaging. HRS and alcoholic liver disease, 
yes hrs can complicate alcoholic liver disease both in acute alcoholic hepatitis stage as well as in decompensate stage in acute stage uh, we don't use the term hepatorenal syndrome and i think uh, five or 10 years down the line nobody will be using the term hepatorenal syndrome now it is always aki aki and aki because this has been propounded by the critical care specialist and nephrologist so we we, we are now we have also accepted as a hepatologist the term aki and we are now saying aki can complicate alcoholic liver disease in acute hepatitis stage aki can complicate alcoholic liver disease in chronic stage in acute stage there is no use uh, of using um, any uh, vasoconstrictor only the drugs which alter the rheological property of rbc or the viscosity of the blood or drugs which are antioxidant and anti inflammatory like in acetylcysteine or pentoxifilin or maybe in some cases yes adenosyl methionine there is a small study uh, that can prevent the aki of alcoholic hepatitis but for uh, aki or classic hepatorenal syndrome of alcoholic chronic decompensated liver disease there are two variants one is type 1 which is associated with oliguria and rapid rise in creatinine and one is type 2 which is equivalent to refractory ascites and hyponatremia so for type 1 we have vasoconstrictor like tarlipresin which gives survival advantage and for type 2 we have no drug except liver transplantation now coming to the next question should all patients with altered level of consciousness to be treated with glucose and thiamine and this is very important uh, if you have nothing to offer it's better to start with uh, glucose and thiamine but before glucose with thiamine because in patients of uh, uh, vertic encephalopathy before giving or if the patient is between b12 deficient before giving thiamine if you give glucose so glucose will enter into the brain so the metabolic capacity of brain will further increase and that will further aggravate the neurological disorder uh, so if, you have to treat with glucose you have to treat with methiamine and if there is no other the options available we treat with, and see in practical life with all patient of uh, agitated alcoholic agitated alcoholic irrespective of their liver disease we do give benzodiazepines which are favorable in liver disease so glucose thiamine benzodiazepine alter level of consciousness particularly if agitated should be given but uh, thiamine uh, uh, before glucose that is the that is the thing that needs to be uh, that needs to be focused the thiamine should be given before glucose because if you give glucose before thiamine that will further aggravate the uh, neurological dysfunction now clonidine for abstinence i don't have much idea of uh, clonidine because clonidine is a drug which is used to treat postural hypotension i think uh, in diabetics and in uh, so uh, in autonomic dysfunction in diabetics and clonidine is also very useful to treat blood, blood pressure in uh, refractory hypertension in ckd patient But for clonidine absent, I don't have any idea. You can ask someone who is from. Uh, uh, Sanjay, now coming I, to the questions, I have got a small question. Uh, yes. What is the incidence of HCC in uh, alcoholic liver disease? Now I have shown that in any chronic liver disease, one to five percent develops HCC every year. Every year, one to five percent of decompensated chronic liver disease. One to five is a low. Is it wide? So one to five percent for alcoholic liver disease, two percent for hepatitis B, five percent. For hepatitis C, two, three, two to three percent. So risk is low for alcoholic liver disease, but two percent per year. Uh, Overall liver you... disease one to five percent. Risk is highest in hepatitis B. Yes. And there is an interesting observation that alcohol as an anti-proliferative effect, because alcohol suppresses growth. So alcohol as an anti-proliferative effect. So alcoholic liver disease who have developed HCC are usually abstinent patient. Alcoholic liver disease who continue on taking alcohol. percentage wise less number develop hepatocellular carcinoma because we if either person stops alcohol the anti proliferative effect of alcohol is withdrawn they are more likely to develop hepatocellular carcinoma this is also true for pancreatic cancer complicating alcoholic chronic pancreatitis uh, and uh, uh, then in these cases do you advise that serial uh, alpha fructoprotein test for this uh, pro chronic liver disease patients alcoholic as per the most of the international society guidelines any patient of chronic liver disease should be subjected to serial alpha fructoprotein measurement and ultrasonography whole abdomen every 6 months every 6 months and the purpose of this two estimation both ultrasonography as to identify a liver nodule and alpha fructoprotein to identify a higher level is to identify hepatocellular carcinoma but problem is that alpha fructoprotein in most of the cases and in this two indian series is show nearly 20 oh, yeah, more than 50% of the indian hccs are not accompanied by a rise in alpha fructoprotein that is the problem so alpha fructoprotein might miss 
but ideally all patients of chronic stable liver disease even if they are perfectly okay but if their fibroscan values are something more than 18 because then we call it cirrhosis so they should be subjected to six months the ultrasonography and ultrasonography. okay okay thank you thank you Shandra. you have you have three questions in your question answer box yes sir hey look at other than infection and acute alcoholic disease, what are the causes of acute decompensation in chronic liver disease? I have shown uh, they are mostly drug induced. And in India, these complementary and alternative medicines are really a nuisance. Some of them may, and most of the liver disease patients, they feel these complementary and alternative medicines are very useful for the liver. They go on taking. So that is an important cause in liver because uh, acute decompensation in chronic liver disease, uh, complementary and alternative medicines are responsible for 12 to 17 percent cases. I mean, any other infection by hepatotropic viruses like hepatitis B, acute hepatitis A, acute hepatitis E, hepatitis B, or other hepatotropic viruses like Epstein Barr, cytomegalo, or herpes virus. There may be acute onset immunological disorder that can precipitate acute decompensation. Some patients may develop portal vein thrombus, or that can produce acute decompensation, or acute, acute hepatic vein thrombus that can precipitate decompensation. So apart from infection and alcoholic means, mostly infection, drugs, other metabolic derangement, thrombotic events, or immune dysfunction, they can precipitate acute dysfunction. Second question is NSE dosing in renal failure in alcoholic disease. There is only one study about NSE dosing. They have given it in, intravenously. The, uh, the dose, you have to continue it for uh, 10 days, and the, you need to measure the outcome at uh, 20 days. If the patient does not respond within three days, then Exact dose is 600 milligram thrice a day. Very high dose, you can taper after 40 hours. There is no Indian study on NSC in alcoholic liver disease. If there are any role of prophylactic FFP in case of ALD or CLD, but no signs of coagulopathy, high patient. Okay. This is a very important question because what is the role of prophylactic FFP? Now, FFP is given to reverse coagulopathy. Normal INR value is between 0.8 to 1.2. And to qualify for coagulopathy, it must be more than 1.5. The risk of bleeding is increased if the INR is more than 2. So 0.8 to 1.2 normal. Coagulopathy is more than 1. I am talking about INR. One point, more than 1.5 is coagulopathy. More than 2 risk of bleeding is increased. But unless the patient is bleeding, or unless you are contemplating any invasive procedure like paracentesis, insertion of central line, or any other thing, not endoscopy, not endoscopy, any invasive procedure inside the vascular system, unless you are contem or cavity, unless you are contemplating a therapeutic or intervention procedure, or unless the patient has overt bleed, there is no need for give FFP or fresh progen plasma. Well, another question is that, what should be the dose of fresh progen plasma? Because it is the usual practice to give 40 units of fresh progen plasma, and our residents usually do that. Now, one unit of fresh progen plasma, which is clearly specified by standard blood dose, corrects coagulopathy to 5%. Means one unit of fresh progen plasma will correct coagulopathy by 5%. And there was a beautiful international study in 1992 that has shown that correction of coagulation factors up to 20% is sufficient to tide over the crisis of coagulopathy. So 20% replacement is sufficient. So if one unit gives 5%, you have to give four units. So this is the logic, and this is very rightly done. So this is the logic of giving at least four units of fresh progen plasma, because unless you have correct at least 20%, there is no benefit of giving plasma. So give four units, give only, there is bleeding or you are contemplating any invasive procedure. Fourth question by the same person. Sir, in background of CLD, if acute or chronic liver disease develops and discriminant functions for more than 32, then there is any role of prednisone. Uh, see, prednisolone is classically, has been designed classically for acute alcoholic hepatitis. And in acute alcoholic hepatitis, it is well known fact that 40 to 70% will have underlying liver disease. If you scan the original articles which use prednisolone and which standardize the use of prednisolone, they included acute alcoholic hepatitis. And there were, that was a mixed group, some with chronic disease and some with acute disease, because most of the alcoholics who develop with acute alcoholic hepatitis has a long history of alcoholic disease. So you, if you can extrapolate result of that study, it showed benefit. So perhaps the steroid will also show benefit if a person who is underlying chronic alcoholic liver disease and presented with acute alcoholic hepatitis and is a severe disease, resuscitating steroid use. So irrespective of underlying chronicity, we have to treat acute alcoholic severe hepatitis with steroid. 
but I do believe that if it is an underlying chronic liver disease, the responses are likely to be low, low or less. Anjay, hmm. I have a question. One patient I have seen some time back had uh, this thing, uh, features of early uh, alcoholic liver disease with SGPT higher than SGPT. Uh, and uh, he, also, he was also a heavy smoker. So he had a um, hemoglobin of about 17.6 with high iron and ferritin. So what is the, I mean... So the um, iron is a poor prognostic marker because yeah. patients who have iron, uh, particularly intrahepatic iron, though you are talking about serum iron, intrahepatic iron, I presume it should be high, higher ferritin. So because ferritin is, denotes the storage, ferritin denotes the storage iron. So storage intrahepatic iron is iron. So this is, he is prognostically bad for alcoholic hepatitis or alcoholic liver disease. And he is more likely to progress to an advanced liver disease. Mm. Uh, higher, higher hemoglobin could be because of smoking status, smoking, secondary, right. polycy secondary mm. polycythemia. So he yeah. needs to quit smoking as well as alcohol. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, Sanjay. Huh? Thanks for a very brilliant talk. Now, I want to know that the injury caused by alcohol in the liver, one part is non-immunological and other part is immunological. Now, any treatment difference between the two? See, uh, if you say that there are two defined groups, one is immunological, one is non-immunological. Non-immunological uh, disease, injury, we usually, the, the, when the patient presents with acute alcoholic hepatitis, the injury is predominantly immunological because for the chronic disease, it will take time to develop. When, whenever the patient is present at the decompensated stage, the uh, uh, injury is, though it has started as non-immunological, it is mostly non-immunological. So you have rightly said in acute alcoholic hepatitis or in acute on chronic liver failure presentation of hepatitis, alcoholic hepatitis, the injury is predominantly immunological and that certifies that we have a role of steroid uh, in acute alcoholic hepatitis. But over the years, most of the most of these inflammatory cells are recruited. There is development of liver fibrosis, portal hypertension, alteration in the ecotexture, guard dysbiosis, more and more bacterial toxin in the liver. That also, uh, that also alters the uh, nature of damage in favor of non-immunological. And then yeah, the advanced Thank you. And there is also some genetic predisposition who are more susceptible to alcohol. Is genetic predisposition. Whenever I was at uh, SSKM hospital, we had a paper. One one PhD student was doing that. She is now settled as USA. So that the polymorphism of oxidoreductase enzymes, like okay. NADPH oxidase, like alcohol dehydrogenase, aldehyde, polymorphism of these enzymes are responsible. And Asian people, particularly Asian male, have polymorphism of some of these enzymes. That that got a very good publication. So polymorphism of ox or alcohol oxidizing enzymes uh, are important and they are the genetic determinants of advanced or early liver disease. Presentation. And now I request, I uh, render my, express my sincere thanks to Sanjay. Now I request uh, Dr. Rothin Sharkar, who is one of our course director to give vote of thanks. Thank you, Amulda. At the outset, I must say that I have heard the best master class lecture <laughs> from the clinical point of view. Such a nice and very uh, very lucid, very lucid and um, bench to bedside like that. Huh? So I must thank Sanjoy and Kalidas couldn't join because Kalidas was there. He uh, rang me. I must also thank him for joining, but he was somehow the connection was lost.